You probably know about Ugreen for better or for worse, to be honest. They throw a lot of money and products at tech YouTubers and, well, I mean, they do make decent products. I personally use their M.2 to USB adapter all the time. It's built really well and gives me zero issues at all. Basically, their entire product lineup consists of power cables, USB hubs, phone chargers, laptop chargers, nothing too expensive or complicated to make in my opinion. So when Ugreen told me they'd love to sponsor me for a video on their upcoming NAS, I told them absolutely not. So they sent me one anyways without me signing anything at all. That's cool. <laughs> There's honestly a lot to unpack here. Like way more than I had initially thought. I really thought this was going to be a pretty short video, and I was initially really thrilled to get more competition in the NAS space. So ignoring the somewhat misleading advertising on their site, the Kickstarter for a product that is already designed, made, and being shipped to creators with no release date, a delayed launch that wasn't communicated to anyone. So let, let's just start with the easiest part of this. Ugreen is trying to dive into the NAS space and needed a pro, that's me, to promote their products. So they sent me the DXP4800, plus as a review unit. It is a four bay NAS that has the option of adding two internal NVMe SSDs and it has dual 10. Oh wait, no wait, what's this for? Certain products equipped. I have one 10 gigabit and then one 2.5 gig port for ethernet. That's all right, yeah. So single 10 gigabit ethernet and a 12th gen 10 core. Oh wait, no, so, um, oh okay, no. So mine has a five core Pentium gold with six threads, okay. Whatever. So you really got to dig way down into the spec sheets to kind of see what your specific model is. Kind of misleading, but not awful. Whatever. Now that I'm down here in the specs, I can figure it all out. They're coming out with six models, ranging from a two bay DXP 2800 with a four core Intel Mobile N100 chip to an eight bay DXP 8800 plus with a 12th gen i5 with 10 cores, 12 threads. And in between those, they're also providing four and six bay options. And for some reason, a single bay DXP 480T plus. I'll get into why that's weird later. Overall, it's a really solid lineup, even if expensive. For their cheapest model, the dual bay DXP2800 with the N100, you can lock in a price of $239 right now. Or if you wait, it will MSRP for $400, which that's a really significant discount, actually. My model, the DXP4800 Plus, has a discounted price of $419. If you act now, act now, act now, and a regular MSRP of $699.99 or $700 for weirdos like me that hate your Jedi mind tricks. They cover a lot of different use cases with the various storage and CPU options. And I like how you can actually pick if you really need 10 gig for the 4800 Plus and save $100 if you just don't have a 10 gig network and don't plan on upgrading and just stick with two and a half. As you step up through the lineup though, the prices just start to skyrocket. With the most expensive, the 8 bay 8800 plus having an MSRP of $1,500. Ouch. And what's extra right about the pricing is they're launching a Kickstarter soon to help fund the project, but they already have produced units and are sending them to creators. And not only this, but you can reserve one for $5. And if you do, you get that 40% discount I mentioned earlier. I'm really struggling to understand the point of a Kickstarter if you've already invested the R&D budget into creating not only the product, but the software it's running in. Is this four bay unit the only one they've actually made and the Kickstarter is funding the rest? Is this just pre-ordering with more steps? Are they still working on the other ones? Is this a guaranteed product? Ugreen told me they would start selling units March 26th, but refused to give me a ship date, which I actually asked for a ship date specifically, and they just told me they were selling March 26th, leading me to believe this product is coming out no matter what, which is just really odd in general. If it's coming out no matter what, why do you have a Kickstarter? I'm, I'm just confused. And why such a crazy discount for just putting in a $5 deposit? Are their profit margins that high that they can eat 40% of the price of all of these? Or are they taking a loss on these to try and get more influence in the NAS space? I'm really not sure. All of that strange pricing and advertising aside, what about the actual product that I have right now? Well, I'm gonna be honest. I was impressed the second I unboxed this. It comes with a nice dark aluminum finish and it just has absolutely exceptional build quality. It really is impressive. Even the slots for the screws on the bottom, I mean, they're tapered. That is, I like attention to detail. I don't know. I'm especially impressed by the build quality because Ugreen is new to the NAS space and building bigger pieces of kit like this. And everything you could ever need is included, even two ethernet cables, a small screwdriver, some tools for locking the bays, and an owner's manual that doesn't really dive too deep into how to use it, but from what I understand, they were making a proper help page for the NAS. It is just not done now since, well, these haven't been released yet. The drives are also insanely easy to install as they should be. You pull out this little slidey thing, you put your drive in, you close the little slidey thing, and you slide it into the other slidey thing, and then you slide the slidey thing upward, and then it's locked, and then there you go. Uh, <laughs> it's actually a really nice change 
compared to my Dell workstation I recently got where I had to bend the entire drive bay outward to get my HDDs in. So this nice sliding and locking system is a pretty nice improvement over something like that. So installing drives is easy, but what about the SSDs, the upgradable RAM that they so proudly display on their website? To get to those, they include this cute little screwdriver and screw it, I'll use it, they included it, why not? There's a little flap on the bottom with these two screws I was mentioning earlier with the countersunk holes. So we just take these out and there's a little spring that pops up the panel and that, I mean, that, that's pretty, that's pretty nifty, it's a nice touch. And in here we have our eight gigabytes of DDR5 that we can upgrade all the way up to 64 gigabytes with two 32 gigabyte SODEMs. And then right here are the two slots for the NVMe drives that are super easy to access. And they also include these chunky as hell thermal pads for those high performance SSDs. But uh, how do we change the boot SSD? Or really get anywhere to do anything? They mentioned on the website how the higher end models come with a boot SSD that's 128 gigabytes instead of the 32 gigabytes of EMMC storage but where is that what about the thermal paste when that gets all old and dried up how do you maintain anything this is kind of locked down well don't you worry you green didn't make me sign anything so we're gonna do some digging later for now if you're a normal person who wants to ask how easy is this to just set up and use i plugged in the power plugged the ethernet in and topped right onto my desktop I got the Ugreen app, as they call it on my desktop, which is currently on Mediafire, which is kind of funny. But either way, installed that and it detected my NAS instantly. It let me create an account and password. And after this, I was just able to select my four drives, throw them in RAID 5 for now, and bam, we got a storage pool set up. That was pretty easy. It took me like three minutes, but this is useless without being able to access it on my other devices. So I went into the control panel, turned on SMB sharing, and it showed right up in my network, just like that. Just put in the username and password, and bam, there we go. All set up, able to access files. This is all without even looking at the somewhat short manual. It's crazy easy to set up. And the desktop looking environment also is really helpful if you're not experienced with busy and complicated GUIs or don't want to use a terminal. I could definitely see something like TrueNAS being pretty confusing for a basic first time user who just doesn't want to use any guides and just wants to set up a basic NAS quickly to work off of. The OS itself is also pretty sleek, if a little Apple inspired and pretty responsive. It also has some nifty things like a video player, photo viewer, and uh, torrenting software okay i wish i could use a vpn with that for reasons i cannot disclose but i mean you can use a proxy which is something i really can't fully utilize the nas though because the phone app doesn't exist at all yet uh, the phone app is coming out march 18th the day they would like me to release this video so that's not gonna work for me uh <laughs> they also did tell me they were planning on letting you use vms and even bringing docker to the os which i think that is really really cool and it's going to make this a much cooler system to mess with when slash if those eventually come out this could be a pretty nice beginner nas for a lot of people that don't want to dive too deep into os's and learning all of that stuff and i did have some smaller things to point out and the script is already really long so let's just rapid fire some can set up fan settings and disable the LEDs or put them on a schedule. This is great if it's in your room. Same with power, I can schedule to turn it on or off. Really nifty. Multiple users is always appreciated if you want to share the NAS. I could really see a use case where you buy a four bay, split the cost of somebody and just split the storage in half. Can't copy and paste passwords from a password manager even when using the web browser to access the NAS. I really, really hate this, especially because Keeper can paste my email but not my password into the login box. Why, you green, that is just, what? When trying to set something up like the download manager, you can't create a file in the menu that asks for a folder to point to you have to go back and create a folder and then come back if you're transferring files there's no progress bar or confirmation it completed really frustrating wasn't even sure if the file transfer was working when i was testing the sd card slot i had to look in their version of task manager to see if it was actually doing anything i tried setting up a movies folder to try their plex alternative and when i tried to set the movie folder it gave me an error and when i tried again it said the folder was already in use for movies and then it worked how about that to show the one movie i added with a video of mine i had to force it to rescan about three times then it showed up in chinese not ideal for me because i speak american i also thought i could stream the movie over the hdmi port on NAS to a tv but it only plays on my pc i guess you need the app for that which as i said before is not released bummer and i mean i'll be honest a lot of that stuff is additional not really necessary stuff because i mean this is a NAS. so how does this do as a NAS? network attached storage well it works Okay, there's a little bit more to that. They supplied me with four WD Reds, which struggled to get anywhere close to the 10 gig transfer speeds due to uh, these being WD Reds and being SMR. Even using RAID 0, I struggled to get write speeds to 10 gig, but read speeds were decent. I'll give them that. But testing with an SSD, this really isn't a problem. It's just the hard drives they supplied. It's also really quiet unless you're hitting it really hard. Then the fan does ramp up a little bit, but it's still normally extremely quiet. If you are really pushing the CPU though, the little CPU fan starts going crazy. 
crazy, but it's not the loudest thing in the world. It draws 38 watts idling with display out and four drives in and about 37 watts with no display. And when I push it a little transferring files, it drew between 40 to 55 watts. All things considered not terrible. Uh, I mean, that's less than a regular light bulb. So, you know, it's, uh, it's not bad. Now, I bet you're asking yourself, if the software is kind of half-baked and not all there, why bother testing it? Why not just use TrueNAS, Unraid, Proxmox, Windows Server, anything else, really? Well, the software, it comes out of the box with the NAS, and it boots right into it. So let's just do a little bit of digging. And before I say anything else here, I did all of the following before you green told me you are not supposed to be able to load another operating system on here, and that is not a supported use case for this NAS. So... Anyways, back to doing the thing that I really wasn't told I wasn't supposed to do, but then later was told I wasn't supposed to do. And you know what? Whatever. It's fine. Ugreen, please work with me in the future again. So if you press delete on the Ugreen splash screen here while it is posting, you can get into the grub bootloader. If you hit C, you can just type exit and exit the bootloader, which is nice because that means I can try to load a pop OS. But every time I try to install it, the whole thing just turns off and it restarts. So instead of trying to demo pop, I tried to properly install it, which did get me a little bit further for some reason, but it still just closes. Ah. So let's just go ahead and take the main SSD out and see if we can get this to run just something, anything else. So I went ahead and started to take the whole thing apart. So I went to take it apart to see where this SSD was and how hard it would be to get to and uh, man. This really got out of hand, I'll be honest. So, like I said before, changing up the RAM and adding two SSDs was not too bad at all, but getting to this one was tough. And if you wanted to, I don't know, change out your thermal paste, that would be here. And yeah, this 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 is kind of insane. And what makes it worse is these screws are torqued down really, really tight to an absolutely insane degree. And some even have paint over the back threads. So trying to break them was just awful. I mean, I know this is a purpose-built machine and compromise incentives made for space savings, but honestly, this was harder to get into than a lot of laptops I've used. I will say though, going through it again, I really only needed to take 12 screws out to get to the SSD, and it wasn't as difficult just to get to the boot SSD. You just gotta take out these rubber covers on the back. There are four of them here, and then behind each of them is a screw. Once you get those four screws out, you can pop this back cover off. Normally, I have to go through the front of the NAS and push it with my hand. Actually push it pretty hard, so be careful. And then there are four more to get this big, nice fan out. And then after that, there are four more here to take the outer shell off, which gives you access to the boot SSD. Getting to the heat sink to change the thermal paste is what really makes this a process because you have to take this whole cage off and it's just a whole pain. The plus side is the lack of any form of adhesive or clips. I absolutely love that. That means you can pretty much take this apart as much as you want without risking breaking clips or having to glue it back together. So overall, I would say this is pretty nice. And as far as I'm aware, the SSD they put in here is actually pretty decent. So big ups for not cheaping out on something that 99% of people won't see, but would probably notice if it failed and be pretty upset because it would probably fail out of the warranty period. Big ups, you green. Either way, I went ahead and took the main SSD out, but even with no other SSDs, when I try to run pop, it just randomly resets. <sighs> So I took the boot USB off and finally, with no other options at all for booting, it finally kicked me into the BIOS. My God. Maybe there's a key I didn't try to get into the BIOS or something, but right now with the information provided to me, I was not able to get into it easily. Either way, once in the BIOS, I disabled Watchdog and enabled boot from all the NVMe SSDs. Then I was able to throw Pop! OS on here because it's, I already had it on a flash drive and I'm just too lazy to go back and this video needs to be done in four days and I take a long time to edit, so whatever. So now that Pop! OS is on here, the experience is actually pretty great. The Pentium Gold has plenty of power and of course I threw a Minecraft server on here and it ran amazingly well, which is just bonus points. That means that we could easily throw a TrueNAS or a Proxmox server on here, which I think I would prefer personally over Ugrain software, especially with being able to upgrade the RAM up to 64 gigabytes. I will admit though, most people that buy this probably don't want to go through this trouble of installing another OS and will probably stick with using Ugrain's built-in software. So really that's a downside for everyone because their base software isn't fully done in the oven yet and it's really difficult to get aftermarket OS's running on here. So it's definitely an interesting value proposition trying to get um, anyone to spend a lot of money on these. I will admit though, they have been updating it as I've been working on this, so some of this information probably isn't even accurate after the launch of the video because they are updating this so frequently. But as of right now, it is definitely not an ideal experience, and they even did push off the launch by a couple of weeks to help work on the software and improve it. I will say they're trying at the very least. And this is this thing is so expensive. Okay. 
Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. A bit of an internal debate I have on videos is kind of cheapness and practicality versus what people would actually do and buy. Because as it turns out, a lot of you just enjoy watching me be an idiot and struggling while saving money from the comfort of your one owner laptop or expensive pre-built gaming PCs. And there are a lot of things in my eyes that are just simply a complete waste of money that plenty of people think are amazing. I mean, pre-built editing PCs, brand new expensive laptops, and Honestly, I think this NAS might be one of those things. My current NAS is just the Optiplex from my $100 gaming PC video with a dual core Pentium in it. It has three refurb 12 terabyte Seagate Exos drives and a software RAID, two are in RAID 1, and the last one is just an extra backup that I have. So it has 12 terabytes of usable storage. Maybe the CPU wouldn't be up to the task for a lot of things, including 10 gig, but you could step up to a newer Optiplex and maybe a Skylake chip or something. Even build a new system for some better CPU performance for not that much more money. Here's the thing. If you go used, let's be real. The drives do have a higher chance of failing. It will take up more space, use more power, and this is going to sound stupid, but the process of just having to physically buy a USB, put an OS on it, and then set up any sort of operating system. I mean, hell, even Windows is already too many steps for a lot of people. We all know it's true. Just look at Apple. They have made billions of dollars by it just working. I hate it, but it's true. And as much as I want to stomp all over this and say it's expensive because of X or Y and say that the software can't do this or that, it's a first-gen product from a company that has never done this before. 